and recently I turned 60 years old and I happened to hear Pink Floyd's song called Time uh, from the Dark Side of the Moon album. In it, the lyrics state, and you run and you run, catch up with the sun, but it's sinking, racing around to come up from behind you again. The sun is the same in a relative way, but you're older, go to a breath, and one day closer to death. It's a pretty grim view of life when you think about it, but how many of us really hold on to that, right? I mean, they view the day-to-day, -day and uh, you know, to me, it's, even though it was grim, it got me contemplating the questions that come with entering the third stage of one's existence. Um, what does it mean when you have fewer days ahead of you and behind you, when you're closer to the destination than the starting line? We're told that even the Buddha originally had these same observations after witnessing for the first time the hardships of sickness, old age, and death, Prince of Dhaka felt compelled to seek the answers out. But I truly felt after reading the story and hearing the story when I was younger, that like many of us, his search was initially born out of fear and not immediately an altruistic gesture to save all beings. His fear of the sickness, old age, and death that he had recently seen made him realize that this would inevitably happen to him. The answers that Siddhartha found we know today as the Dharma, and it's been a guide to many for over 2,500 years. The Dharma's teachings help us to understand that how we perceive our life conditions often determines the level of our contentment. This includes our transitional ends as corporal beings. Centuries ago, and even nowadays in many parts of the world, there was, and still is, physical hardship, food scarcity, inadequate shelter, unstable social and political conditions. And as time went on, this forged a belief in most people in their societies that a life of physical comfort would afford a life of happiness. Many of us in America probably enjoy living conditions that significantly exceed that of the historical Buddha, Prince Siddhartha. Yet we seem distant from the elusive goal of bliss, ever focused on the past or future fears, missing out on the present now. Why do we still complain of our situation with all the comforts of a prince and more? How can living such a good life make us worried or fear that we are as impermanent as all the things that are around us? Buddhism's five remembrances are a reminder and a wake-up call just for this topic. Perfectly clear, compassionate, and concise five remembrances of Buddhism at its very best. First found in Vajjitana, excuse me, Vajjitana Sutra, aka Subjects for Contemplation. They are intended to be recited, memorized, and even said every day as a mantra. It goes like this. I am the nature to grow old. I cannot escape old age. I am the nature to get sick. I cannot escape sickness. I am of the nature to die. I cannot escape death. All that is dear to me and everyone I love are of the nature to change. There is no way to escape being separated from them. I inherit the results of my actions of body, speech, and mind. My actions are my continuation. The first three lines are basically what drove Buddha to become the Buddha. But the last four lines really drive home impermanence, karma, and continuance. If you look at Zen master Dogen's central teachings, he tells us that the meaning of what we do is expressed completely in what we do. Perhaps then, the answers we seek lie in the most famous sutra in all of Buddhism, 
the Heart Sutra, also known as the Prajna Paramita Sutra. This sutra discusses letting go of dualism, life, death, and really all things. In the sutra, it says, form does not differ from emptiness, emptiness not differ from form. That which is form is emptiness, that which is emptiness is form. The same is true of feelings, perceptions, impulses, consciousness, pretty much everything, right? The so Buddha life and Buddha death, Buddha summer and Buddha winter are just different expressions of the same thing. An analogy I like to use is the waves and the ocean. An object of mind is an object that exists in the imagination, but which in the real world can only be represented or modeled. The Heart Sutra separates this mind, an object of mind, dualism further by stating, no realm of eyes until no realm of mind consciousness, no ignorance, and also no extinction of it. The sutra goes on to state, with nothing to attain, the bodhisattva depends on prajna paramita, and the mind is no hindrance. Without hindrance, no fear exists. Far apart from every perverted view, we dwell already in nirvana. In the three worlds, all Buddhas depend on Prajna Paramita to attain Nuttara Samyak Sambodhi. These last words translate to unsurpassed, complete, and perfect enlightenment. In other words, our fears are born and our desire to attain, attach, hold on to. And here's the kicker. We're already where we need to be, but we can't see where we are for all the distractions. Interesting. The sutra concludes with the goal of unsurpassed, complete, perfect enlightenment. So proclaim Prajna Paramita Mantra. Proclaim the mantra which says, Natagate, Paragate, Parasamgate, Bodhisattva. This last line is powerful, and in English it means gone, gone, gone beyond, gone beyond the beyond, enlightened and done. The depths of our Buddhist Dharma can help us to solve the deepest questions and fears of our life and of death. But its principles can also be applied to the ordinary, moment to moment, everyday fears and mundane concerns with equal satisfaction. It is said that in order to know the path, you must become the path. For me, my journey is just starting, but not knowing that I'm already there, I will continue to seek the way. Thank you.